Okay, so it's Christoph Quilson and Ken O'Neill, and we're back talking to you about things <coughs> having to do originally with JKD with Jeet Kune Do. And this is your one of your most requested topics that I've gotten through email and, and personal messages. And that is, well, how do you build the fighter? <laughs> or or how do you build the perfect fight system? Because JKD has changed, right? Yeah, yeah, JKD has changed. And so uh, one of the things like uh, Ken and I both don't do what we were exactly trained in, and we were trained in a very modified uh, uh, form, uh, com although Ken trained with Dan and Asanto, uh, which would kind of make it formalized. I, I, I didn't do more than a couple times with Dan. So the point is that we have stuck with the framework of JKD though, and that's what's important here, and that's what we're going to talk about because the framework of JKD is is still valid, although we have found that a lot of the techniques and the strategies and the way that Bruce fought is not the way that you should fight. And those those things from the 60s and the early 70s, like I've said for decades now, just are antiquated. They're archaic, and there are better things. And and you're also facing a different type of person because there's more leakage of how to fight to to people. So anyway, uh, that's my preface to this topic. So I'll let Ken give you his background uh, philosophy on this. So what's your background philosophy on this topic? Yeah, I, I agree completely. I mean, uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the things people forget about Bruce is, uh, my God, the guy died in his early 30s. You know, he was and he was already changing a lot of stuff. We know, especially those those last few years, man, he was at an accelerated level of, of, uh, you know, uh, washing out a lot of the old Wing Chun that didn't work for him anymore. And, you know, getting way more into dealing with how do you deal with grappling? How do you deal on the ground? And, uh, you know, really expanding, you know, my prediction would have been give Bruce another 10 years and he would have, uh, <clears throat> you would have seen him working a lot more with, with, with actual, conventional weapons that are on the street more, you know, you wouldn't see nunchucks flying around and all that stuff. Uh, I, I'm convinced he would have stayed real. And, and you know, he would have still probably had, I'm sure he still would have had his training he did for his movie stuff, which he had always said is close to what he did personally anymore toward the end. So, yeah, but, you know, what we're talking about here is, is the, the the conceptual framework, you know, the philosophy, what, what the JKD philosophy expresses and that's that's a continuous continuous <clears throat> analytical process you know looking at things testing things and you know when you when you have some gaps in what you do and in your training you go out and find a way to fill those right and then you have to you have to test them you have to test them under pressure and you know the idea is not to keep adding thousands and thousands of techniques but to have fewer techniques that are more adaptable in more situations and then continuing to drill and find different ways to to test those fewer techniques so that you can make them adapt you know rather than you what you the, the, the idea of trying to have eight thousand techniques so that each technique is a specific answer to a specific thing is ridiculous i mean you can't you can't train all that stuff you know so it's you know it's really a a, a constant evolving and adjusting processes is, is probably the simplest way I could I could put it. You know, like what's really worth training, and what do you need? And you you can't do what Bruce did anyway. You don't have his body. You don't have his exact mentality. You know, everybody's different. But what they need to do that Bruce did is embrace the philosophy and and apply this process and figure out what they can and can't do, and then forget all the rest. You know, these guys, some of these guys that are still so hung up on these particular styles, just they're missing the point, you know? I mean, it's like my guys, we've spent a lot of time in the last seven years, we're going through a lot of systema training and a lot of drills, and there's a lot of good stuff there, but but there's a lot of stuff there that it only works for the top two or three guys in the art, you know? Because all they do is train every day, all the time for years and years and years, and then you, you see people trying to mimic stuff that they do at, at the higher levels, and it's like, that's not you. That's not practical. You can't do that. You don't have your background. You weren't a Spetsnaz guy who trained all day, every day. You know, you got to get real with 
who you are, what you can realistically do, and what you can create that works for you. And that that's the bottom line. There's my preface. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So there's a lot there because the details are missing. <laughs> and many things, many things take away, but the, the, to reiterate, it's about having the framework. It's about having the framework, the conceptual framework, and maintaining that conceptual framework that you're going to eliminate things and only spend time on those things that have a hard ROI, which is return on investment. Uh, because, mm -hmm. uh, because that's that's what you need as a normal person. We're talking to normal people, uh, even guys in the military uh, in contracts that I train. They are not. They have limitations because of their carrying weight and because uh, they're also in compromised situations where they're not at their peak ability because they, they've been they're exhausted. They're, they can't see that well. Uh, they don't know the surroundings. It's not like a. It's not symmetrical. It's not symmetrical like ring sports are. And uh, I'm not going to go into all of that right now, but it's just an asymmetrical battle space. And that means that you're going to probably be disadvantaged. So you have to have things that work and multi. And they have, it's sort of like if we're going to use a, let's use a car analogy here. If you try to make the best and the fastest car for a straight line, that's a dragster. But if you try to make it, for a road track with a lot of curves and stuff, you're going to go to Formula One. But the problem is, if you become a Formula Formula One car, you're not able to handle the, the off-road stuff. You can't handle the, the terrain. You can't handle the Baja, for example. And so you, there's always a compromise in what you're doing, and you have to try to become that vehicle that can fit the most environments. And that is something that sports guys get hung up on because they start learning – this and, and it works well in the sport environment because it's maximized for the sport environment where they can see well the heating and the cooling is controlled the 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 flooring is, this footing is good there's other people around you there's you're not going to get multiple people coming in they're not going to be using weapons we'll get to weapons later i want to keep that separate right now uh, so that they get confused and, and, and they think uh, narcissistically that this means that they're very powerful in situations that are completely different and they are not because they're not trained for it. It's like, it's like saying if, if we're doing things, you know, I've been shooting, I've been shooting a shotgun. That doesn't mean you can, you can, you're a sniper. That doesn't mean you can use a handgun. They're different. They're different weapon platforms and you have to be good at them. So you try to eliminate as many different specialized techniques like, there's all sorts of things you do in boxing with sort of bobbing and weaving and, and juking and playing these games, uh, which work well in the sport because of the limitations of the rules. But you have not moved your feet, so you're still can be taken down. And that is something that's a very graphic representation that a sport mentality limits you. But what I'm saying is the overall mentality of, of training, <laughs> like an MMA or something, is a limitation. And, and you're talking about people being limited by looking at some arts and saying, I want to, I want to imitate this guy. You know, I want to be Bruce Lee. I want to be Mike Tyson to use that, or I want to be these guys in sustainer. Well, uh, you, you're not going to be able to, you, you should be going for the lowest common denominator of what's going to work in the most situations. And that's what I do. That's my job. That's why I, when I, so I do as a subject matter expert, I have to do that. I have to produce results and I have to produce them with guys with different building and they can't spend forever. Uh, training on the stuff and it has to be immediately uh, applicable in a lot of different environments. So that's the same thing though, however, is it absorb what is useful and hack with the unessential. And that is something that we're talking about here. So when you do that, you, it's still, it's still, you're using the operating system or motivation or goal and objective to change what you're doing to become simplified, uh, uh, applicable in many situations across the board so that you can uh, save your life and maybe other people. And, and too many people get abstracted into other things, which you talked about uh, a little bit there. So, uh, and I can get into, well, we're not there yet, but we can get into exactly what you should do. And, and the first thing I think is to stop idol worship, right? When you say yeah. that, I mean, you, yeah, you yeah. know, stop this. <clears throat> yes. Go ahead. No, I'm agreeing. Yeah. Well, because 
this is the thing too. There's so many people you still see them. There's people in India, for example, trying to act like they're Bruce Lee. They're saying they're doing JKD, and they never train with anybody Bruce Lee trained. You know, no one, and and no one that someone that Bruce trained. They're 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 just removed. They're trying to look at his movies and read the Tao of JKD, which won't make any sense to them really. Uh, no matter what they say, just parroting back phrases doesn't mean you understand the language. Here we go again, freezing up. Whoa, looks like you're back. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay. So we had a we had a glitch there. What a glitch with the signal dropped here in, in the jungle. So uh what I, what I'm going to say, what I was saying was that uh, you can't imitate like Mike Tyson without doing everything that he did. You can't imitate uh Muhammad Ali and Bruce Lee uh there's a lot that people should uh, garner from reading the latest biography about him because what they think he was like is not anything like he was like. So yeah, there's a lot of new. That's, info. I mean, yeah, I'm gonna stop at that. I'm gonna stop at that juncture right now and turn it back to you because. But I'm saying, you know, part of the problem is that people have to. They have to. You have to be iconoclastic. Uh, you can have role models, but you have to have a role model who's a who's a generalist, a person who can who can teach you how to be you. Uh, and that's the problem people are trying to imitate. They're not trying to become themselves. So back to you. And yeah, <clears throat> let's let's start giving us a, a few little examples here. I'll, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of guys are in a lot of arts that use, uh, here's a good example, that what do they call it in Japanese? They call it the kotagash, that this outward wrist lock, this turning wrist lock, right? Okay. <clears throat> you know, not that that's not a decent lock or that it won't work, but I've seen so many guys from so many arts that get so attached to that. And it, it's, it's comical because I've got guys in my class now that have trained that for years. And because the nature of, of hanging on to those things is to <clears> – <throat> be sort of in, in, a, in a cooperative agreement <clears throat> when you're training that with a partner who in essence is is really not trying to stop you from putting that lock on most of the time you know so it, it's it's very funny to see how as soon as you just forget who it came from where it came from and you start taking things like say that outward wrist lock and and seeing how realistically you can apply that in a free form fighting situation and actually pull it off and do it over and over and over again. This is the process, right? Do it over and over and over again. Do it where you're, you know, you're trying to intercept and apply that off of a guy throwing a punch, right? You're trying to do that off of a, a, a stand up grappling situation and slipping over and trying to get your hand and apply that lock. And you, you have to create all these different test parameters, every single one you can come up with and think of and get really creative with this. And then see how often you can actually make that technique work. And, you know, if you can only pull that off one out of 30 attempts, so it's time to flush it right down the damn toilet and give it up, you know. And that's just, for me, that's just kind of a nutshell way to, to kind of kick off the idea how to get some of you guys to start looking at things differently and thinking about them. I mean, you've heard us both talk about how many, how many crazy kicks we've eliminated over the years, you know. 
you don't need a bunch of kicks. You know, you need maybe one or two kicks and some stomping and you need to really know how to use your knees and elbows in close. Uh, you'll see that fits very well. But a lot of the kicking makes you vulnerable, you know, especially when you're, you're trying to train in an optimum way that that what you do to deal with multiple guys uh, isn't so dramatically different from the same stuff that you use dealing with one guy. You know, so here you are trying to, to work all these exotic kicks and and and, you know, when you see that they're failing, it's time to look at that and think about what, what do I need to do? And if you do this honestly and realistically, you're going to find out what we found out, which is that most of the kicks go out the window. I mean, straight, solid front kicks that you can throw while you're walking that you can, you know, in and out fast, keeping them lower. Uh, stomping, stomping feet, feet are very vulnerable at close range, especially if you've got heavy boots or something on, you can do a lot of damage and it doesn't take a lot to maintain those. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to sit there and do all the crazy hip stretching and, and, and back, uh, strengthening stuff that we had to do for years and years to be able to throw that crazy Jun Fan sidekick, which if you're paying attention, you can, you can get out of the way of that thing. So why, why, you know, easily. So why do you, why would you spend all that time doing something like that? That has all those limitations. So here we're talking about this, take the stuff, even if you really like it, but test it realistically, don't test it in a cooperative setting, just beginning that kind of process right there, put you into the JKD conceptual framework of, of doing your research, testing, being analytical, figuring out what you really can and can't make work. What do you think? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, uh, here's something I want to say about all that because you're kind of assuming that these people have all sorts of time and to do this, and they and they don't. So to save them, I mean, to save them time, because you're saying go in and empirically research the things, which is great. If because if you don't want, if you don't believe us, just empirically test it and do it. But it's going to take you a, a long period of time. You're gonna pay the price. Uh, for, you'll get hurt because that's just the nature of this when you're testing stuff out. And uh, you're gonna have to find a bunch of people who will not be cooperative with you, which either means getting really great training partners or going to do it for real, uh, which is stuff that I all went that I did. But the, to save you time, it's better to learn from us who've actually paid the price, and, and so we're not giving you. We're saving you time, and you're getting things that are effective. That's that's one of the main things. That, and uh, like a normal person who has a normal, you know, not a normal. This, I'm saying that people who have a job and who are not obsessed with uh, fighting, but but need self protection and self defense because everybody does. Then you are better served by coming to us because what we're going to do is give you thousands of hours of research and application and operational experience. And thus saving you the hardships of having to go through it on your own. Uh, and we can clearly let you try it if you have, think you have a better idea, which people have all been come to me before. And I'll show you that no, because I've already thought about it. I've already tried it. And it doesn't work. I'm using what I'm using because it is, it, it's effective and it works in many situations. And something, okay, I want to switch into this because you and I have not really talked about this too much, but this used to be Mike Sandlin's big thing. And it's actually true. Because people, oh, it's, not, it's not just, I'm not negating anything he ever said. What I'm saying is that it needs to be emphasized because people who've been in real situations, and I mean life and death situations, war situations, are, are going to, or they've been, someone's invaded their home or carjacking or something like that. You're going to go through an intense mm -hmm. fear, fear, emotions. This emotional content that none of these guys are talking about. There's a very few people talking about. You're going to be paralyzed. You're going to be paralyzed. And the things that you do in BJJ class and, and other places aren't going to work because you're going to be scared shitless. And that's something. And low light and scared. You got two people on you that are maybe going to try to kill you. It's not boxing. It's not kickboxing. It's not BJJ. It's not anything that you've been practicing. It's nothing you've been doing. You have got to have been in a situation and trained where you were scared, which is what I do. I mean, it's what I do. This is one of the things. There's a lot of ways to do that. I'm not going into trade secrets and how that how I can do that, but my stuff is isomorphic. And that's very important because people are not training isomorphically. They are not doing it. And I'm talking gigantic fear. Now, you, because you were training with uh, 
Mike, you went through this, and and you also talked a couple times about uh, putting that. Was it a girl that you threw into that uh, situation? Where you just had her go into a room and she didn't know what was going to happen. And there were guys in there that she didn't know, and they had armor on and they attacked her. That's yep. the sort of stuff that we're. That is what we are talking about. And antiseptically hearing about it and saying, "Well, yeah, well, I would." No, you would because you don't know what the fucking emotions are like. It will shut you down. You will go back to your. Uh, you will go back to your reptile pr- processing center. All of this cognitive forebrain shit's going to be shut down. You're going to bypass. The, uh, the mammalian uh, center. You're gonna, you're gonna be, you're gonna be reptile level, and you have got to be trained at reptile level to respond in reptile. It's called uh, state dependent learning. Uh, Rossi and Rossi did a bunch of research in this. I used to, I, I, man, I have, I know all this stuff. I know, my, I know my field. I know all this stuff. But if you don't train in the same, that's why NASA science, uh, scientists train astronauts the way that they do. That's why if you get elite in military, you train with live fire <laughs> events. Why? Because that's what you're going to face. And if you can't, if you haven't faced it before, there's no way of knowing how you're really going to respond. Yeah, there's training deaths. There's training deaths uh, they don't like to talk about. But guess what? There's going to be more training deaths if they back it down to uh, to things like. Uh, laser tag or something you know because then people are taking risks same thing with people who are doing uh filipino stuff training with the knives and sticks and things and suddenly you put them in a real duel they'll die because what they've been doing what they train is 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 fantasy world it's it's not working they don't know because they're not risking anything they're going out there with some of them using foam sticks and shit. what the hell there's yeah. no danger. There, you risk nothing. I think we talked a little bit about that before. But if you don't risk anything at, at a certain level of training, you are not ready for the real thing. So that I would, I would, I would put in there that the emotional component is huge, and that it's qua non to training, and a lot of people do not ever address it, and they don't know how to train it. So uh, I mean, that's one of the things that. That where you and I differ from other people because it's something that we know is integral to actually being successful. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, you want to talk about that a little bit? And, well, yeah, and add to that, or yeah, and we have before too. But you know, it's it's yeah, you you've got to get it as close to to what people are going to really experience and feel as you possibly can without like, doing severe damage. To me, that's in a nutshell what we're talking about here, and uh, and that is that is just so completely different from from like you said from the sport approach. Not that there's not some fear there, but it, it's it's much more limited fear because you know in the back of your mind you still know that well somebody's going to stop this thing before I die, you know, and that's that's there. And like you said, you're in, you're in a, a nice flat thing with mats and. And, you know, there's a lot of people around, there's doctors around, there's a lot of light and it's not the same and it, it's not the same level of fear. It's a different, different kind of fear that comes up with those unknowns, you know, and, you know, it's for one thing, it's really funny. I'll talk to guys because I get a lot of guys that have been in a lot of arts and I'll say, um, so how much ambush training have you guys done? They go, what? I go, well, how many, how often do you train where, and yet you alluded to this when I told you about when I trained that gal. Uh, Terry, who was trying to convince a police force to let her on because she did, didn't quite meet the size requirement. And uh, they go, what do you mean an ambush? And I go, well, you know what the word means, right? You know, I said, how often do you set up situations where somebody just mm-hmm. suddenly gets jumped and, and they're not expecting it, you know? And the best way to do it is to not even do it in the class. I said, it takes some work, but you can do it. You can set these things up where, you know, you, you, you jump, jump, have one of your boys get jumped in the morning when he's getting in his car to go to work. I know it sounds crazy and it sounds extreme, but this is the kind of stuff that you have to do if you want. I've, I've been, I'm nuts. I mean, I've done all kinds of crazy stuff with, with a lot of my guys over the years and, and all that came from Mike. The, see, you know, I'll, I'll yeah. want to say something else about that. You know, I mean, yeah, I had a few years with, with in the Dan thing, which I, I, I broke away. Well, I was the first one to break away from that and, and, He's a great guy. He's a great, he's a very good teacher. He's, he's, he's a really good, you know, like a good history 
you know, kind of teacher, you know, and, 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 and a chalkboard guy and trying to show the lineages of all these stuff, which now I'm understanding that he perhaps had a lot of bad information from some of, some of the guys that he got his info from on, on actually lineage of some of these arts, but that, that's another story. But, you know, the point being that the, the, the way Mike approached the training and, and the, the, it, it was pure JKD mentality. It was ex extreme analysis. It was, you know, setting up ambush situations, suddenly creating a scenario and putting you in a room and saying, okay, here are the parameters of what you have to deal with. And, and we do that to this day. And, and it makes, you know, people are more versatile. They're, they're more used to, to feeling a different kind of level of fear and having to really adapt. You know, most martial arts that I see and, and other ones that I've looked at, they don't prepare you for anything like that. You know, everything is such a set structured cooperative game that people are playing. You're not, you're not learning how to solve problems and you're not learning how to solve problems while your breathing's affected. And, and, and your body shaking, you know, you have all this fear and all this going on, man, it's a completely different thing that we're talking about here, you know, and a lot of guys don't want to do it. Now, I have noticed that there's a lot of guys that say they don't want to do it and they'll try it and naturally they'll fail like everybody does initially at least. But then there's something in them that says, yeah, but I want more of this because now I want to know. And then you see guys start to get stronger and they start to grow and then they start to look forward to it. They go, okay, go ahead and scare me. Take your best shot. You know, I want to see if I can get out of this. And that's cool when you see that. You know, I know you see it and guy because you just made them stronger for life, you know. And and then they then they start getting into it. They want to be challenged. They they don't want to succeed all the time. They want to be challenged. They want to find find their barriers and then try to break through the next barrier. And that's what we're talking about. It's a whole different process. <clears throat> yeah, the uh there's a lot again in there and uh what what is making me think is that we should this should we should make this part one because uh, there's just if we try to rush through all of this that uh, that we plan to say I think would be a be a disservice so we'll just you know we'll we'll stick on we'll stick on certain aspects here for this talk and then move to the next time we do the talk we'll just continue because uh, I think it would be a disservice to to try to cram everything in because you you and I are basically we're giving out loads of information here loads. Uh, now we're not giving out the particulars on how you do it, but we're definitely giving the framework and the paradigm, which a lot of people don't know. And uh, you've got to admit that Mike was really good with that aspect of, of it because he was always trying to be pragmatic because he'd been in Vietnam. He'd, he'd been in Vietnam. He'd seen, obviously, what happened to people in Vietnam. And he knew that, one, you couldn't trust anybody. He didn't. And that anybody within your peri perimeter had to go if they were not on your side and on your side meant they were actively fighting with you and if they weren't fighting with you they were against you and that was the way to survive and he had watched the uh, uh the korean guys who had been deployed also there and they just they just scorched earth everything and he said they didn't take any chances and we should have done the same thing but the u.s didn't but that's another story i'm going to go on and on about vietnam but the point being <clears throat> the point being is that if you don't ever have, have this fear, and people try to say, oh, I don't have fear, or you're gonna reading about fear, looking at fear in movies, it's not the same. Uh, this postmodernism crap of, well, I can over, no, you can't overcome it until you've actually been through it. <coughs> Op operational experience, and it's like you said too, it, it's a process where it takes time. You have to acclimate to it. And some people do gravitate towards it, and some people who think that they, it won't be a problem is a massive problem. It's a massive problem. And uh, I've been in those situations. People tried to kill me in lots of places, lots of different places, and uh, mm -hmm. shot at me. And uh, I'm talking in a lot of situ situations. Uh, people try to kill me with blunt weapons, uh, <clears throat> knives, all sorts of stuff. But that does not mean mean that I'm looking forward to any of those just because I've made it through the past ones I am not looking forward to any any new adventures in those realms but I do know what I have to do I know how to switch I know I have to switch my mindset or I will die and that's something a lot of people have a hard time with and that's what Mike was talking about the combat mindset 
being able to switch your uh, body to know that everything is serious and as serious as in it's either you live or you die serious and any sorts of ideas of fantasy or artificial optimism could get you killed could get you killed and you also cannot be paralyzed by fear and hope that it will go away this is the same thing that people who don't think about their own self-protection so happen that suddenly they get carjacked or they get held up or atm robbery or the first snatch because they're oblivious uh things are not unilateral game theory it doesn't matter what you think or it's what someone else thinks because you're not in control of the world you don't control actions you don't control anything so you've got to realize that someone else wants to put violence on you then it can happen because it doesn't matter what you think you, you can you can retaliate like a millennial and cry and want a safe space it doesn't change a damn thing you know because welcome to the third world baby i, I can take you places where Whatever you're gonna, if you get the, if you don't get killed, you're gonna get the shit beat out of you, and robbed, raped, and everything, and, and all things in between. So, to avoid that, you've got to change your mindset, and that's one of the things that that's vital. And that mindset is stripping things away because you don't want a thousand techniques. And we've talked about this before. Like if you have a thousand different shoes, you go through a dilemma of which ones to pick. But if you have three or four. And you're like, okay, I'm in this situation. I need uh, the boots. Uh, I'm in the situation of water. I need the waterproof things. Uh, I'm going to go running. I need these shoes. That's it. You know, that covers it. And that's the same thing too. You have to select. And we're constantly, uh, the, both you and I are constantly trying to whittle it down. Like I'm trying to remove things, you know, you, and, I, and it's like, well, you know, can I, can I take this, this and make this work across this situation? Yeah. I might have a better idea, but okay, would it be better though to use something I can use in four different environments as opposed to using two things uh, in, in the four different environments? You know, I, I'm trying to get it down. I'm trying to get it down to sheer, like you're uh, massively hurt, uh, your IQ is low, <laughs> you're cold, you're miserable, you're hot and sweaty, uh, and you're losing energy. That's something we have not talked about yet either too. And that's something you kind of broached, but didn't really specifically say. And that's about energy demand. Energy demands uh, are crucial in our selection of what we're going to be doing. So anyway, I just want to say that that aspect about the fear, it, it is massive. And uh, you will be paralyzed. And I don't care how many karate classes you've taken or BJJ classes. And, and yeah, there's fear. Like if you get in a ring with somebody, uh, gym wars at certain places. You go to Holland and kickboxing, they'll try to knock you out. You know, if you try to get in there with eight, you're not A class. If you try to get an A class guy, you're gonna get knocked out. I guarantee it. So uh, <clears throat> that being said, though, it's not the same as like you said, dying, and you don't know uh, because you know how long a round's gonna last. Uh, it may seem forever, but you, it has a it has a duration. Whereas in reality, you don't know. It's like Start swimming in the ocean, and uh, the ship went down. You don't know how far it is, so you have to think a different mindset about how you're going to survive. Uh, so that uh, that's separating us from everybody else because we're giving you this is reality, brother. You know, <laughs> that's how it's got to be. Uh, uh, but you want to you want to start on the energy aspect. And, and I think that, I mean, if we cover the energy aspect, I think that'll be enough for this time. Because you know, it's quite a bit, really. So, I mean, what do you think? You want to uh, talk about that? Or, uh, that's, that one to me is a little tricky. Because I'm don't i not sure how to go there without getting into some pretty kind of, it seems like it'll get a little complicated. Um, I mean, okay, well, what you want to, what, uh, okay, well, what other what other aspect? I mean, there's a lot of dynamics here. What other aspect do you want to cover then? Uh, uh, in this in this talk in this yeah, in this without, it taking, yeah. without it taking two hours. Yeah, it's a good question because yeah, we did yeah, well, yeah. here. It's going to take some time. Um, I don't know. You know, you know what? go ahead. What? What's that? No, I was gonna, well, no. I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, it's just that uh, if we expand, because I mean, there are specific specifics that we can tell people that you need to do this, you need to do that, because you're developing you're developing a personal system for yourself. And so what what we've said right now is that you need to use things that are that work in a lot of settings, and you also have to train yourself, uh, or you have to go to someone who can train you when you're scared, because if you can't do it, if you can't do it when you're scared, then it's useless to you. 
And that's like that outward wrist lock will never work like you were talking about. That you'll never do that scared. That's fine motor control. It won't work. Uh, and it's also just not the right answer. You, you, you just don't see it, you know. Uh, Vikings were never using it. Roman centurions were never using it. So there's a reason why. Because if you're in the mass of like they call fog of war and you've got chaos going on around you and massive people dying all, all about you, you got to use stuff that's going to be effective, efficient. Uh, and allows you to move on to the next person. So I don't think you saw any outward wrist locks being used anywhere in that. <laughs> now, I got, so, you know, you, I, I got something for you on your energy subject. One thing I would throw out that I think will be a nice tidbit for these guys, and that would be this. <clears throat> Good example. If, if you look at what the Marine Corps is doing now, because they've changed it again, on, on how they're training guys for this kind of thing, there's something that they do that's 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 really good that I like, and and it would it's this, they they put these guys in a room, and they're getting ready to just to really make them go at it, and uh, you know with a little bit of protective equipment on. So from the energy standpoint that you brought up to to really simulate all those things like you said the fog of war, you're exhausted because you've been humping a hundred pounds of shit for the last. 10 miles and, and you're, you're slugging through mud and you're, you're exhausted and you're afraid because, you know, you know, there can be snipers or, you know, the whole thing, really extreme, crazy stuff. So even in a situation where say you're, 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 you guys gear up and you're going to, you're going to fight. All right. Well, while guys are waiting for their turn and one of the things the Marine Corps does, and a lot of people do this, but it's just interesting how I just saw how they, how, what they showed, <clears throat> you got the guys that are waiting around. So to, to, to create that energy depletion feeling so that you can experience it and really learn how to deal with it, they're sitting there and they're, they're throwing around like heavy dumbbells or they're doing like constant, you know, burpees, squat thrusts and stuff. And they're just like you do when you go out to go combat shooting, you know, you do a bunch of push-ups and a bunch of stuff to get shaky before you shoot to, to at least get some of the, the, the physiological muscle control stuff uh going flaky on you like when you get scared right so you know you 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 force yourself into a state of energy depletion and getting exhausted before you jump in there and start to fight see already that takes it up several notches and makes it far more real because you're starting to learn how where your energy reserves are going to go and what you're going to have to do to try to survive i think that that's that's a great way to start i think that's a really excellent way to to begin to test yourself and to begin to test your guys uh, on how to deal with that. I just wanted to kind of insert that. I think that's a good example of how to begin to train with it. Yeah, well, there is a, you know, uh, if you're a professional fighter, you're doing that sort of stuff too. MMA guys are doing that. Sure, they're, sure. They're, they're, blow, they're blowing themselves out. There, there are differences though, because uh, what you're saying is to lose coordination. Uh, because as a professional fighter, you still, because you've done it so much, you hardwire yourself that you're not losing coordination like a normal person. But a normal person loses everything. Yeah. So that that's that's something. Uh, whereas even if you're a professional fighter, though, but you're cold and frigid, I mean, if you lay in the ice conditions and in the snow and stuff, you're gonna lose co you're gonna lose coordination. You, you will lose coordination. So environmental. Uh, changes and an adaptation and being immersed in ice baths and stuff like that and then trying to perform will be a good to give out some information here but another one like you were talking like you were talking about something else that will do that very quickly for people is it, for before training like you're saying lose your coordination before training uh this is you testing stuff. You should already learn it. This is not you learning it this way. You've already learned it supposedly, and now you're going to try to apply it. This application stage. So you do a series of sprints, uh, 40, 50 meter, 100 meter sprints, and then get blown out, and then have to do because that uh, that's the sort of thing where your legs are shaking uh, if you're yeah. not recovered, unless you were a real sprinter and that's what you're trained to do, <laughs> uh, or carrying weight. Uh, they uh, we found in the military we do this a lot with. Their, contractors do we have people either that or farmers carries uh, a lot of people know what that is you're carrying weight like suitcase or wheelbarrow and you're, you're moving weight as certain you've seen in strongman competitions that will blow you out like you would not believe it's, it looks like it should be easy but it's not because it's just uh, it takes a massive amount of energy to move extra weight and that's one of the things that we found in modern warfare 
carrying these heavy rucks, you're carrying more equipment, uh, you're minimum, minimal. And this is like if you're an op a Delta operator or whatever, you're carrying, you're still carrying 30 pounds, at least 30 pounds of shit. Uh, you as a normal person are not carrying 30 pounds. You don't know what it's like. That it changes everything. So, and, and that upwards from 30 to 115 pounds. And that's you just with 150 pounds, not you doing 150 pounds for days, try it for days. And you've got that systemic fatigue built up already too. Uh, but try moving like that. Try running with that weight for your life because someone's shooting at you and you're trying to make it behind cover. That's the sort of thing. You do that, like if you're moving like that, and then you, then you train. That, that will teach you about energy because then you will have to start. You can't fight like Jackie Chan. That's what I wanted to say. That's, this is what I want to put in there specifically about the energy thing is that you cannot do this acrobatic stuff. You can't fight like you see in the movies, which is time consuming uh, because they want to look at it. People want to watch it. They want to uh, admire their handiwork. That is not what real fighting is about. It's about boom, 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 next, boom, boom, boom. And, and I'm talking that fast too. And if you're not moving that fast, then you don't know the right, you don't have the right technology. You're using the wrong things, your sport fighting, your traditional fighting, you got the wrong things. Or you're trying to do that outward to the wrist lock. <laughs> to get back onto that. You're trying to do that. You're trying to do the outward wrist lock because that's going to take you 40 seconds to try to do it, at least to try to do anything. And it still has an answer. Now you're getting swarmed. You know, you gotta think about being swarmed. This is yeah. the fear that you gotta put into people. The swarm fear. So uh, that swarm fear will already have you exhausted. You were you were a scuba diver. I mean, you can talk about how people who are scared of the of of going under like whatever how many meters and how much oxygen they burn through, right? Because yeah, yeah, it's scary. I had um, I had uh, my regulator lock up on me in Jamaica back in the uh, when in the hell was it? Back in the seventies, late seventies, and. Uh, you know, we're on a drift dive, which means you're you're in a really strong current, and you know, you're just flying over the reef because the current's pulling you that fast. And well, you know, it's it's one thing when you can't breathe in in 60 feet of water and can go straight up. So, but imagine this: you're in 60 feet of water and you've got to do a free ascent because you can't breathe. And instead of going this way, you're going this way. So 160 feet can turn into 180 feet or more really fast. You know, and then you, 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 you get into a situation a lot of times they call shallow water blackout where, you know, you're, you're just nitrogen issues, O2 is cut off and you, and you black out. And, uh, yeah, that's real scary. I mean, a lot of things can happen when you're diving that, that are, are other good ways to test, test fear. Not being able to breathe and knowing you're in water is, is uh, some scary stuff, you know. I think that's that's one of the reasons a lot of times that's a, a dual purpose reason I think sometimes like seals and guys like that they waterboard them so they understand what it feels like to drown you know because they're doing underwater stuff plus the the idea of being tortured that way and uh, you know just that, that kind of you know fear facing stuff so yeah <coughs> there, yeah, it's, uh, yeah the, I, I, I was I was caught I was caught in a, I was caught in a riptide uh, I was caught in a riptide off of Panama in a, on an island, and it didn't look like a riptide. And it actually, uh, my girlfriend at the time, we both were caught in the riptide. I had to tell her, do not try to, to panic and go straight back in because we're going to have to angle. We'll have to angle back to the beach because what happens, uh, we're at the surface, obviously, of the water. And people expend so much energy because they're trying to fight their way back straight because they, they get scared because, as you're saying, it's take the riptide takes you at an angle. It takes you back out to the open ocean, basically at an angle, and and you cannot get back in straight. You just don't have the strength or the power. I mean, you're not you're not a Chrysler uh, hundred uh, fifty horsepower engine. And people die fighting the riptides. They die fighting the riptides they, because they panic because they're unable to make any progress. But the thing is, you got to realize in this case that you're gonna you can cut you. Can, get back in it's just going to be like a mile and a half from where you entered and that's that's what i had to tell her i had to say no no you know we're going to end up like a mile down the shoreline but we can get back in and obviously we did but yeah it, it, it is a scary it is it is it is a scary thing because you have zero control 
zero control. And it's just like we are we are not made for the water, really. And point blank, we're not made for the water. We're vulnerable, we're weak, we're slow, we're everything. You know? So uh but those are all things where the panic sets in, and that's what we're talking about, because we're really about the emotional aspect of, uh, on, on this. It's all about the emotional aspect. It, it, all of fighting is about the emotion. Self-protection, self-defense is about the emotional aspect. And uh, But anyway, I think, though, this has been – this is really uh, – once again, like our last talk, and I had a lot of people respond positively about that to me in private messages, it's very information dense. So there's a lot to go back and hear and listen to and get the nuances and, and ferret out the information we talked about. So I really think that we should basically end it for, the, for this episode, and then we'll pick it up again on the same thing, because there's, there's more to say about this. And uh, it's, it's a big uh, field. And the over the overview that you and I wanted to do is actually just uh, was kind of ambitious. <laughs> I think it was kind of ambitious that we thought we we're, were really going to get through all of it in one session. So um, that's what I'm saying. I think that we should end it here uh, on part one, and then we'll we'll pick it up again because this is a crucial topic and it's the uh, request topic. So. You know, we can go more into things. But we gave out a lot of information, didn't we, Ken? Oh, yeah. We gave out a lot yeah. of information. Hopefully, they, people get the idea. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Ken and I will talk to you in the next episode. Uh, share, like, uh, subscribe, and uh, and all of that. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. See you guys. Signing off.